Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to World Bank Group Data Privacy Day. My name is Tammy Dawkin. I am Chief Data Privacy Officer for the World Bank. I will be moderating today's session. The session of our two-day data privacy series of events is a fireside chat with our featured speaker today, Julie Brill, Corporate Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at Microsoft. Julie leads Microsoft's work on privacy worldwide, so I am elated we have her here with us today. To deliver closing remarks, we have Ms. Aradna Kumar Kapoor, Director and General Counsel at MEGA. And we're honored to have Mr. Denis Robitaille, Vice President and Chief Information Officer of the World Bank Group, to give opening remarks. Denis' work managing the bank's information management and technology portfolio touches on so many of the principles that underpin Data Privacy Day. And we are thrilled to have you here with us. Over to you, Denis. Thank you very much for that introduction, Tammy. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. It's good to see you and our distinguished guest speaker from Microsoft, Ms. Julie Brill, along with the uh, MIGA Director and General Counsel, Ms. Haradana Kumar Kapoor. It's also nice to see so many colleagues and others around the world joining this important dialogue on the role of the private sector in helping to safeguard data and enabling trust. Integral part to that trust is the respect for privacy and the fundamental rights of individuals to have control over their own identity and their interaction with others. Managing personal data responsibly at the World Bank Group is about treating people fairly and openly. Drawing upon global data privacy standards, the new World Bank Group data privacy policy sets the foundation for how we use personal data. The driving force behind the policy is to demonstrate to our staff, clients, and other partners that we take the protection of personal data seriously. It's also, of course, a business imperative. It demonstrates to our clients and partners that they can trust us with their personal data. The need for this policy is more important than ever, as we recognize currently the need to use personal data to help address and combat the COVID-19 pandemic. To help manage the pandemic, some countries are using contact tracing, for example, which raises concerns about the use of personal information to track the spread of COVID-19. But getting people to use contact tracing apps requires that they trust the companies responsible for their development. The national and, and, and local government agency responsible for the rollout and all the above for the responsible use of their data. I note that trust will also be required to ensure that we all get vaccinated. With technological advances, we face new challenges for privacy and the protection of data. We rely on technology companies to help remain vigilant in the face of growing cybersecurity challenges. We hear or read stories almost every day of data breaches that affect people's personal lives. Cyber criminals have been taking advantage of the uncertainties surrounding COVID-19 to increase their use of social engineering attacks to trick victims into revealing sensitive personal or business information. At the World Bank Group, we take data and data privacy very seriously. Ten years ago, we implemented the Open Data Initiative and the Access to Information Policy by making our operational projects and financial data open to the public, along with development data, tool, and research. In today's interconnected environment, it is our responsibility to foster a good understanding of how our data is collected, used, and shared, and what action we need to take to better manage and protect our personal information. In support of the new World Bank Group Data Privacy Policy, our information and technology solution teams have been collaborating with the data privacy offices across the World Bank Group to procure and deploy new technologies to better manage information and data according to the relevant policies and directives. Microsoft is a long-standing technology partner of the World Bank Group. It has vast experience with various national and international privacy laws and with helping its clients comply with the new privacy regulations. As we take our first step, as we take our first step, 
uh, in implementing our World Bank Group data privacy policy. We look forward to learning from Ms. Brill's experience, both at Microsoft and in her previous role at the US Federal Trade Commission. Data privacy is about being a good data citizen, and it's more relevant now than ever. Thank you all for being here today to become better informed on good data protection practices and global data privacy issues. Back to you, Tammy. Thank you, Denise, for that wonderful opening. Um, I'll expand on that just a bit uh, for those in the audience who aren't familiar with um, how the bank operates. Um, Denise was emphasizing the new policy that we have because we do not are not required to meet the requirements of regulation. So unlike Microsoft and other private sector companies, we don't uh, we, we aren't held accountable to GDPR. CCPA and other regulations. The policy is our law, if you will. And it's a very important signal to the world that even though we don't have to, we recognize the importance of managing and using personal data in a, in a responsible fashion. So with that, we look forward to the discussion um, on the, the, the lessons and the uh, tools that we can learn from our private sector partners. So Julie, I'm thrilled to have this fireside chat with you. Um, I wish it were in person. I'm picturing us sitting side by side in comfortable chairs in front of a fire, perhaps with a glass of um, something. But uh, we are not able to do that this year. But with that visual, let's get started. There's so much happening in the world this past year alone, I almost don't even know where to begin. Um, I, I would like to call attention to a remark that Elizabeth Denham, the information commissioner from the UK made in her speech uh, earlier in, in today's events. She called out the importance of digital innovation and it's, it's key to the kind of development work that the, bank, uh, that the bank conducts. I was struck by that because I just read uh, Microsoft's chief executive Satya Nadella was quoted saying, we have witnessed over the past year, the dawn of a second wave of digital transformation sweeping every com company and every industry. So even in normal times, the development of privacy norms and trends is incredibly fast. And this is likely to continue as the second wave of digital transformation affects every facet of normal life. So jumping right into COVID-19 um, and its impact, as uh, Denis, uh, as Denis mentioned, um, we've all lived, it, the last year living a very, very different sort of life, a life that revolves around using technology as a conduit for all of our social and occupational industries. Julie, I'd love to hear how you uh, foresee people's relationship with their personal data changing on the other side of COVID. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. And first, let me just thank you, Tammy, uh, you, Denis, and uh, the World Bank for inviting me to give this or to participate in this fireside chat. Um, Tammy, I think we have a date next year to do it, hopefully in person, hopefully in front of a fire or a virtual fire. And as you say, with uh, some form of a adult beverage or regular beverage in our hands. Um, but let's, as you say, jump right into it. I mean, the pandemic definitely uh, has changed people's lives in, in so many ways. Um, and as you point out, um, you know, Satya Nadella has uh, said, and, and we believe quite strongly, that uh, companies have gone through a tremendous digital um, transformation, as have individuals, um, over the past year. Uh, people now work. Uh, virtually, if they're able to. Um, they uh, socialize virtually. They entertain themselves virtually. Indeed, people are mostly staying connected with the world virtually, again, if they're able to. And that means that a lot of technology is involved. And frankly, data is involved. Data to allow people to communicate, to allow their ideas and their words and their videos flow from themselves to others. 
And that means that people are thinking a lot about privacy and about the appropriate governance around their data and frankly, around whether they as individuals and also organizations have appropriate control over, over that data. We also know that data is going to play an incredibly important part in helping solve many of the societal uh, issues that we currently face. Uh, Denis mentioned contact tracing, you know, uh, an exposure notification technology that does assist uh, individuals to understand if they have been exposed to other individuals who might be infected uh, with the virus. But even issues like climate change and sustainability, um, helping bring about a just and equitable economic recovery um, and other, other health issues are all going to involve some kind of data. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the things that we have learned is that if people are going to trust the systems that we build, if people are going to um, uh, engage and allow their data to be used in appropriate ways, in responsible ways, they need to understand that there are guardrails around that, around that data. And, uh, you know, honestly, Tammy, I, I'm thrilled to hear that the World Bank recognizes, uh, and not surprisingly, the need to put in place um, standards for itself, even if there are not laws that apply. Microsoft has actually done the same thing. You know, when it comes to contact tracing, just as one example that uh, uh, Denny has used, but also other, other data uses in the context of COVID, you know, right now the United States, just as one example of a jurisdiction, doesn't, doesn't have a baseline uh, privacy law in place. And so many companies in the United States were kind of caught flat-footed, not really knowing how they could unlock the value of the data and allow for insights with respect to the pandemic to be obtained while ensuring that they had the right guardrails in place. So one of the things that we did at Microsoft was we actually issued principles around contact tracing and exposure notification. There were seven principles, and we did that really to start a robust conversation around the world about what are the ways in which we need to protect data as we are using it to help people. And so these principles, seven privacy principles, were focused on things like obtaining mean meaningful consent, using the data that is uh, obtained uh, only for public health purposes. Don't share the data other than with consent and deleting the data as soon as it is no longer needed for the public health emergency. Those are the kinds of principles that we think are important to bolster trust, but also to provide organizations, the World Bank, Microsoft, and our literally millions of customers understand how they can use data appropriately and, and in a way that will actually help people. Very interesting. And um, I'm struck at the fact that there are seven principles in this statement. Our policy as well has seven principles um, that are commonly found in data protection regulations. So uh, very much along the lines of what you just enumerated for your contact tracing or exposure notification guidance. Um, what else has changed at Microsoft with COVID and what are you seeing with employees and customers' attitudes and do you think that our relationship with our data will change going forward? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I do think, um, you know, as I was alluding to, people are much more uh, attuned to the fact that uh, th there's a lot of data that um, they are sending and sharing, and therefore uh, there does need to, um, th or they are paying much more attention to uh, kind of the, the trust that surrounds that data. And I do think that one of the things that, um, you know, we're focused on at Microsoft is uh, helping our customers because let me take a step back. Microsoft kind of sits at the center of a very vast data ecosystem. Our uh, success 
largely comes about when we help our customers succeed. And many of them are large enterprises or large organizations like the World Bank or other uh, governmental organizations. And so what we um, are very much focused on during this time of um, COVID and while so many people are working online together, one of the things that we are focused on is helping organizations have appropriate insights into what is happening uh, with their uh, employees, what is happening with their customers, that is individuals, and uh, how to ensure that the data that is being used and collected satisfies the laws and goes above and beyond the laws where appropriate, where there are no laws that exist in order to build that trust. So it really is job number one for us uh, is to maintain trust. And we believe that one of the ways, one of the most important ways to maintain trust is to build privacy into all of our products and services, as well as our communications with our customers. That's nice to hear. You value uh, the concept of privacy and build it into the products um, in a privacy forward posture. Um, thus, Microsoft's great, um, great reputation. Um, I, I heard someone compare um, or talk about COVID-19 and data privacy as the perfect storm. And 2020, the year 2020 is sort of um, a turning point in how we will approach the use of personal data and our attitudes toward data privacy. Um, so I, I, I look forward to, to seeing where this, where this goes in our, uh, in our approach and our professions. But um, let's turn to regulation again. We know um, that more than, uh, by our count, more than 140 countries have data protection regulation, uh, give, or, give or take, um, and with varying degrees of enforcement and activity. Um, of course, the North Star or the, the pivotal uh, regulation is GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU. And it's hard to overstate the impact that GDPR has had on the direction of privacy legislation. Yeah. What do you see as the main ways that GDPR is influencing the global privacy debate? Um, I, I agree with you. GDPR has become the North Star. And uh, if you look around the world, as you said, there are well over 125 jurisdictions uh, that have now privacy laws on, uh, on their books. And what we're seeing, particularly since GDPR became effective in 2018, is that uh, major economies are now uh, adopting or considering or revising privacy laws to align with GDPR. We look at um, jurisdictions and economies like Brazil, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, Thailand, uh, and e even India um, are passing these new laws or revising their laws. New Zealand is another great example, you know, revising uh, their uh, prior laws to align more closely with GDPR. And one of the reasons, of course, why this is taking place is because of the adequacy requirement that GDPR places on uh, uh, countries that are going to receive Europeans' data. So that if data about a European is going to flow to another jurisdiction, the European Court of Justice, the highest uh, court within the European Union, or one of the two highest courts within the European Union, has said that that jurisdiction, the receiving jurisdiction, needs to be, uh, needs to have laws that are essentially equivalent to those of the European Union. So, you know, it, it is something that, um, you know, uh, uh, countries and, and uh, policymakers around the world have been looking at very seriously because they want to be able to communicate and exchange data uh, with Europe. Um, and so what we're seeing is GDPR is really driving the global conversation about what are the privacy norms that uh, should be existing in society. Um, when I take a step back and think about 
What are the what are those norms? I mean, there are many of them, but I bucket them into four categories. And I use these categories when I talk to policymakers elsewhere in the United States, both at the federal level and at the state level, who are also considering privacy laws. Um, when you take a step back and think about GDPR, what, is it, what does it focus on? It focuses on transparency, consumer empowerment, corporate responsibility, and strong enforcement. Now, there's other aspects um, that are built into GDPR, but when I sit back and think about it, I think of those as the four key pillars to, um, privacy, uh, to good, strong privacy legislation that is fit for purpose for this coming decade. And GDPR is driving that conversation and has established um, these global norms. And I think what's going to be important going forward is for the global community to you know, continue to have a conversation about whether the global norms that are currently in place, GDPR and, and now these other jurisdictions, have really struck the right balance with respect to things like the right to privacy and the right to know, sometimes called the right to be forgotten, but uh, you know that, that buckets in that privacy and right to know balance. You know, did, did we get that balance right in, you know, under GDPR and elsewhere? Things like privacy and security, where we start thinking about things like child sexual and abusive material or national security. Um, or do we need to be having a global conversation around how do we ensure that data can flow freely and at the same time that governments can appropriately and responsibly access data in order to keep people safe, secure, and to protect children, among other things. And I think that, you know, there's also a conversation to continue to be had about, are we striking the right balance between privacy and innovation? Or perhaps I should better say privacy and innovation, because I do think that there needs to be innovation around privacy, and we're seeing a tremendous amount of that. We need to also make sure we can unlock the value of data, as I was talking about before, to solve some of our most critical problems. So we, th this balance is really important about privacy and innovation. And you know, then there's also a, another question that GDPR and this global conversation uh, entails, and that's, you know, where do these balances and where should these conversations be taking place? Are they at the what I'll call federal level, the European Union, Congress in the United States, or in other jurisdictions, you know, at the in the national capitals, or um, or or actually in 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 uh, multi jurisdictional organizations like APAC is another great example, or should these conversations be taking place at the member state level in Europe, or the state level in the United States? Or maybe a better way to put that is, how do we bring in all of those voices to ensure that this global conversation is taking into account all of these different issues? Uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm jotting notes here because so much of what you're saying resonates with us. Um, we are implementing our privacy policy using a risk-based approach, of course, balancing the need and the desire to use personal data to fulfill our mission, but also making sure that we are taking into account the potential harm to individuals. So whether we are innovating in development or uh, taking care of our staff, we're always uh, looking for that balance to make sure that we aren't stifling anything that we're doing, um, but yet incorporating into the work that we do data privacy and the, the interests of individuals. Um, you also mentioned uh, data subject rights, uh, the right to know, the right to be forgotten. Um, we're also building in and uh, those types of um, um, access rights, if you will, and the right to complain and looking for that balance. What's too much? What's too little? Given our business model, we don't um, serve consumers. We don't operate a 
uh, social media platform. Um, yet we know that this is an important component to responsible data use. So we are uh, we are having those discussions and trying to strike the right balance. And um, I think I, I think we're doing a really good job. Um, we'll we'll find out in as the years roll out, but um, again, that balance is really, really interesting. Um, back to taking it away from GDPR and to the US, you mentioned um, one of the, the four areas of GDPR is consumers. When I hear that word tied to data privacy, my head immediately goes to California mm -hmm. and California as the um, the, the, the front runner, if you will, in the U.S. in developing um, its own state regulation, of course, uh, came in with a flurry and it's already been amended and updated and focuses quite a lot on consumers. Um, do you view, do you have, do you have a, a, an opinion on whether that is an appropriate approach for the U.S. or uh, if in a perfect world, what would you like to see for the U.S.? So the the it's a great question. Um, the efforts in California, in in Washington State, and in other states has really been a, a very important catalyst to the conversation throughout the United States around privacy. And frankly, it's been an important catalyst. These state efforts have been an important catalyst to uh, the discussion around uh, a federal baseline privacy legislation in the United States. Um, Tammy, I think as you know, um, I've been involved with uh, privacy issues as well as consumer protection, as well as competition issues for three decades now. And I have seen more activity around privacy legislation in the United States at the federal level and the state level than I have seen in these three decades that I've been involved in these issues. I mean, the, the activity is really enormous. You mentioned California has, has a law on the books. It was adopted by the legislature. And now the voters have um, augmented that law through an initiative that was just adopted in November. There are now 49 state privacy bills in the United States. 23 of them are what we would call a comprehensive pri privacy bill. They're, they're, they, they're not sector specific or technology specific. Others, the, other, um, the others are you know, COVID specific privacy bills or biometric facial recognition bills, things like that. Um, we support these state efforts because we think it is so important to adopt privacy laws in the United States so that we don't have a race to the bottom, we have a race to the top. And we, um, we believe in uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, as you talked about, it's got consumer right in its name. Um, and uh, we support the new initiative. So uh, with respect to the California Consumer Privacy Act, we, I mean, we, we provide GDPR's consumer control rights globally. We, we have not segmented that for just Europe. And similarly, with respect to California's consumer empowerment tools, that's how I like to phrase them, um, we provide those throughout the United States. We don't segment out the California market from the rest of the country. And so, we, so we're very much supporting the notion that consumers need to be empowered. They need to have the control, just like you are building in to your standard for the entire World Bank. Now, the, consumer, the California Consumer Privacy Rights Act, the initiative that was just adopted, builds on CCPA. And the most important aspect that it provides is clear company responsibility for data governance and at bringing in some of those GDPR-like concepts around accountability and company responsibility. So we're gonna to continue to support strong privacy laws wherever we see them because of the importance to building trust. But at the end of the day, not every company acts like Microsoft. Not every company may have the ability to act like Microsoft, but truthfully, it's really a mindset more than ability.
And so we think it is very important for Congress to step up and to adopt a federal comprehensive privacy law. Again, just to ensure that, you know, we're, we're the, the, the entire digital sector, which frankly is the entire economy, is trustworthy and meets the needs of people now, especially in this pandemic and post what will be the post pandemic world and meeting the expectations that society now places on companies. Yes, and with the, the continued digital transformation as well and the importance of that. So um, I would love to see personally a federal law in the US. I think it would be um, the appropriate and uh, best considered next step for the US. Um, what are your thoughts on whether that could or should look like GDPR, or do you see a different model that would work better in the US? And um, probably uh, looking into a crystal ball, do you think that it's practical or likely that we will get to that point in the near future? I think any law that the United States adopts needs to incorporate those four pillars that I talked about. Clear transparency, consumer empowerment or control, data subject rights, if you will, uh, company responsibility in the form of data governance, strong you know, data minimization, purpose specification, those kinds of issues need to be rolled in. That's what make, those are the kinds of things that make up uh, you know, corporate responsibility and strong enforcement. And you know, from my perspective, in addition to the need to have the federal law to maintain trust and make sure we don't have a race to the bottom. Really, in the absence of a U.S. federal privacy law, the U.S. will not be a part of the global conversation around whether the global norms that, are, that have been established have struck the right balance. And as we move forward and recognize how important data is to solving some of these problems, the United States has a really important voice I think that should become part of this global conversation. But if it, if it demonstrates that it doesn't really care about privacy because it's not enacting a comprehensive privacy law, I think that it will not be as forceful a voice in these global conversations. I mean, the United States has some very strong privacy laws as we all know, sector specific laws, around credit reporting, around banking, around children. And many of those laws have inspired GD or have been part of GDPR. So there has been transatlantic inspiration going back and forth, but now it's really the United States' turn, turn to step up and to demonstrate that it understands the importance of filling the gaps between those sector specific laws. And look, one way or another, there's going to be policy. There are going to be global norms. So it's not as if US companies won't have to comply with a global norm, they will. It's just that, that those global norms will be established by others and the United States won't have a voice in establishing them. So if, if the US wants to continue to have that voice, um, I do think it's going to need to enact a law and if it doesn't, I think that the balance of power, you know, the United States is usually a fairly important player on all sorts of uh, discussions around global issues, but it will be absent from this discussion around whether we've struck the right balance between innovation and privacy and between national security and privacy and all of that, digital safety and privacy. And that balance of power will shift. It will shift from Washington, D.C., to Brussels, to Tokyo, to New Delhi. And it might even shift from Washington DC to the state capitals in the United States of Sacramento and Olympia and perhaps Albany. And that will be what it is. Um, I, I don't think that's an ideal situation. And I think there are many, many people in the United States who are focused on this issue who also want to see a comprehensive privacy law. It's about ensuring US competitiveness. It's about ensuring US thought leadership. Again, not 
being the only leader, but participating and helping to drive the global conversation that we're gonna be having over the next decade about how do we unlock this value of data in a responsible way so that organizations know what they can and can't do. They understand the guardrails. Very good. I would love to see federal legislation as well. Um, perhaps we will get there. Um, let's turn to accountability, which um, is a concept that you mentioned as one of the pillars in businesses um, being held accountable. Um, we are working to put into place um, a privacy program that will allow us to demonstrate how we are meeting the principles and uh, hold, uh, hold ourselves accountable. Again, we don't have a regulator that um, comes and looks, but we want to be able to make sure that we can show what we're doing. Um, how does Microsoft approach this? You are uh, obviously an extremely sophisticated uh, uh, company. Um, I know that you've, uh, you've had a wonderful privacy program in place for a long time. Um, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on how to do this and any tips that you have um, for uh, a, an organization like ours that's just getting started or a smaller company that um, might be looking for a way to do this um, but doesn't necessarily have the budget or the, the resources. So we'd love to hear some, some guidance from you on that. Sure, happy to. Um, it is really a privilege to be at Microsoft. Um, as, as you noted, I, I have had other um, roles in my long career uh, involved with privacy and competition issues. But at Microsoft, um, I find that we are sitting really at the center of an immense global data ecosystem, as I mentioned before. And what I so admire about Microsoft is that we take that role incredibly seriously and we embrace it. We recognize that we just, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. And another way to say that is, you know, whatever the laws might say in particular jurisdictions, we, would, we clearly have the ability to scale our systems so that we do one thing in Europe and one thing in the United States and one thing in California, one thing in New York State and something different in Tokyo. But what we have done is we've said, there is a North Star, there is a global standard, and that's the expectation of human beings around the world. Privacy is a fundamental human right for everybody. And so when we see laws that say, okay, this is now, this is the expression of what it means for privacy to be a fundamental human right, we step up and we implement that. So as I said, GDPR, consumer rights, California, uh, Consumer Protection Act uh, control rights, we apply those throughout the world for GDPR and for California, the United States. But it's more than that because, because we sit at this hub of the data ecosystem, what we really focus on as well is helping other businesses and organizations succeed by building tools for them, by building um, uh, best practices, guidance, and uh, information about how, whether they're using our tools or other tools, they can uh, demonstrate that they too are complying with the laws and these global standards. Listen, every organization on the planet needs to understand, I believe needs to understand that privacy is an ongoing journey because the conversation around privacy is going to be an ongoing journey. And so we are, uh, my team and I and many others within Microsoft, we are, uh, constantly talking to our customers. We engage with regulators, we engage with policymakers in order to understand what do our customers need and what are the expectations that are being placed upon them when it comes to their data use and their data collection. So, you know, we, we ground our commitments in, contractually. We make quite clear to our customers that we are, you know, committing to providing them with the tools and the approach that will be privacy protective. And that's very important for, you know, smaller companies or medium-sized companies to be working with an entity that will stand up 
and and commit to what they're stating. The other important thing I think that is, um, you know, for other organizations, I, I guess I've got two more pieces of advice. Um, one, um, and this is, you know, for any organization that wants to engage globally, that wants to compete globally, and that wants to operate on a, a large scale. Um, and they don't have to be a large company to operate on a large scale. But the first piece, uh, additional piece of advice is to really ensure that you're utilizing technology that has controls that can, that can, if you want to, adjust as laws get modified and as the laws start to grow in terms of what they're going to require in terms of co company responsibility and company accountability. So, um, you know, we, we strive to provide that. There are other providers that are striving to provide that. But just make sure that you're trying to sort of future-proof what you're building, because you, you can't take a snapshot and say that's what the future is going to be. The second, I think, is to really treat privacy, the second piece of advice is to treat privacy as an opportunity, an opportunity to demonstrate your trustworthiness, an opportunity to show that you, you get it and you understand that people need to be assured that their fundamental right to privacy is going to be honored by you as an organization, as a company. And that's things like embracing privacy by design, embracing data minimization through de-identification and aggregating data as much as possible if you're, if you're going to use it. Privacy by default. These are concepts from GDPR, but of course they're becoming part of the global norm. And then a really important aspect is to embrace privacy enhancing technologies. Beyond just de-identification and aggregation, things like differential privacy, federated learning, or look, if you're small and you can't build that yourself, you know, work with entities that are building those privacy enhancing technologies into their products and services. So those are the kinds of things I would say Microsoft is striving to do and, and is embracing in terms of our role to help every organization on the planet succeed and in, in particular in this area of privacy and the kinds of perspective that I would advise and reflect after 30 years in this space, um, I would reflect that um, that uh, all organizations should embrace. Uh, very nice. Um, future proofing, I think, is key. Um, as you say, this is an evolving area. It will continue to evolve at a rapid pace. So. Uh, what we are putting into place is meant to do just that, evolve and pivot and um, reflect what's expected and how we can best um, incorporate these concepts. And then your, your comment about an opportunity. opportunity. Um, this is an opportunity for us as the, the World Bank to demonstrate that our stakeholders can trust our use of personal data. We value trust um, quite quite a lot, and this, I think, will go quite far. Um, one more question from me before we turn it over to our audience questions. Um, and this is along the same lines of um, how you approach privacy at Microsoft. One of, I think, the biggest um, lifts for us is raising awareness and training. Um, because at the end of the day, we're, we're really talking about pretty common sense um, uh, ideas and concepts. Of course, we have technology and, um, you know, there, there's a lot more to it, but it really is at the end of the day, uh, just raising awareness. Um, can you talk a little bit about your approach at Microsoft uh, in, in that and, and reaching the scope of employees that you have? Sure, yes. Um, uh, it, 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 as you say, um, in many ways, it's common sense, but um, I think one of the most important things to create in an organization is a community and shared values around privacy. And communities are created, um, you know, it, it, within companies, not too dissimilarly from how they're created everywhere. Um, so one of the things that we do with our, you know, we've got more than 200 um, privacy managers and privacy program officers, people who are certified as privacy professionals uh, within Microsoft. Um, and we've got uh, lots of others uh, throughout the company who are focused as our privacy champs or engaged in engineering uh, involving privacy issues. 
So one of the things we focus on is information sharing. And the other thing that we focus on is ongoing education. So briefly, because I know we're um, uh, coming to the end of this wonderful conversation, um, you know, on information sharing, we uh, have all sorts of centralized uh, resources. We have a portal. We keep it lively and keep it uh, informative. Um, I issue a newsletter once a month to uh, the entire internal privacy community about developments in the external world and internally. Um, and we do things like privacy office hours. We have a peer-to-peer -peer group. So we really try to build a community. And I think if you focus on that, you'll start to have that kind of um, sort of privacy first uh, socialization within the company. And the other thing, uh, is ongoing education because again, privacy is a journey. So we, no one can think of this as like, I've got this, um, I'm all set. I don't need to learn anything else. Or, you know, I've got, I've got so much I can't possibly learn anything else. Uh, there, this is going to be a growing, expanding field. It is not going to uh, get to level set, um, but it is going to continue to accelerate. And so having you know, uh, your, all your people associated with organizations like the International Association of Privacy Professionals, IAPP, getting uh, the organization uh, to, um, you know, uh, uh, sponsor uh, certifications and education through organizations like, like IAPP, uh, you know, invest in internal trainings. Um, and also one of the things that we're doing now, World Bank may want to pick up on this, is uh, we are requiring every single employee at Microsoft to undergo privacy training through taking a privacy 101 course so that everyone at the company will understand what privacy is about. Having said that, I will say that when I arrived at Microsoft, it was quite clear that Everybody got this. I mean, they, they were quoting to me, like, you know, engineers sort of walking on the pathway to lunch were talking to me about different articles of GDPR and using their numbers correctly, you know, the different articles. So people at Microsoft really get this, but having an ongoing training cycle that everyone needs to participate will be part of that ongoing education to make sure that people understand what's changing and how the world of privacy is growing and accelerating. Oh, your comments are reassuring and uh, reflective of the approach that we're taking at the bank. Um, uh, we have uh, over 180 privacy focal points that have been trained and uh, we are working on making our, um, our, our online training um, mandatory. We have, um, so we're putting in place a lot of what you've mentioned. Um, we have round tables, webinars, open office hours, which are a big hit. Um, so this is this is great. Um, I think I have, I have a note to uh, talk about incorporating IEPP training um, into the program as well. Um, so turning to the audience questions, um, there are two questions that uh, are similar, and the questions deal with how do you balance or incorporate privacy and innovation um, so that you are fostering innovation, but also fostering privacy and not stifling either, either one. Um, I want to tell a quick story on that one. Um, I, when I was a commissioner at the US Federal Trade Commission, I was speaking at uh, one of the major universities in, in the United States about health data and uh, sort of the, the, the uh, health economy, the, the, the um, you know, hospitals and, and um, all, all, all pharmacies and, and pharmaceutical information, all sorts of uh, information in that health uh, ecosystem. And what an executive of a major uh, uh, health provider came up to me and took me by my lapels and said, Julie, you have to enact a law around data and around privacy. We've got HIPAA, but we have a lot of other data and we have a lot of other providers and we have, and the world has a lot of data that relates to health and we don't know what we can do with it. We don't know what the guardrails are. And this was like seven or eight years ago. 
And I have found that was one of those aha moments for me where you had a company executive who said, I want laws, I want rules, because with those guardrails, I will know what I can and can't do. And in the absence of guardrails, I, as well as all of my colleagues sitting at that conference and elsewhere, will dial back and won't do what I was talking about earlier, which is responsibly and appropriately unlocking the value of data. So I think one of the ways that we can really focus on, on innovation in the future and, and kind of ensuring that we can get the value out of data is building those guardrails more clearly so that companies and organizations like the World Bank and you know, all sorts of organizations know what they can do. And not, I'm not saying that people want to go crazy. They don't. They, they really don't. And, and I think it's more about just understanding what the rules are. Because right now, I think there's a lot of confusion. And that's particularly true in the United States. Interesting. You're talking sort of like a, a safe harbor and providing the type of guidance that can um, set people on the right path and consider privacy without um, harming or hampering um, innovation. Yeah, I just to really quickly on that, Tammy, I would not say it's, a, it's a, a safe harbor. I think it's more just like, here are the things that you should do. So do data protection impact assessments. Um, you know, uh, focus on data minimization. Focus on using the data for the purpose that you told people you would be using it for or closely related purposes, things like that. So, you know, it's, it's just establishing, you know, some norms um, that, that, the, that companies will understand uh, what, they, what they need to do and the kinds of programs they need to build similarly to the kind of program that you have built and the kind of program that Microsoft has built. Uh, very good. Thanks for the clarification. So more guidance or guidelines. Yes, yes. Very good. Very good. Um, we have another question. Um, any good practices you could mention in, for, in particular for countries in Latin America? Um, you know, what we're seeing in Brazil and what we're seeing in, in uh, jurisdictions like uh, Venezuela and, uh, and elsewhere, and actually what we've seen for a very long time in Argentina and Uruguay, um, are uh, 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 rules and laws that are um, reflective and inspired by GDPR, um, if not um, what we would call sort of uh, GDPR-oriented laws. So I think Latin America is very much a part of um, this global phenomenon that Tammy and I have been talking about for the past, you know, several minutes. Um, and Latin America um, is is uh, uh, focused very much on ensuring that its economies uh, are able to compete in this global economy and are able to participate because uh, they are, they're focusing on enacting laws that will enable their companies within those economies to exchange data with Europe and exchange data with Japan and Canada and others that uh, either currently have or will soon have uh, requirements very similar to the adequacy requirements that we see in Europe. So I see Latin America as very much in that mainstream. Um, not, not every um, economy has uh, yet mo uh, moved forward in this way, but many have. Very, very interesting. Um, as you're describing sort of this international norm that is developing and uh, that makes that makes sense. Um, last question: um, If you were looking to get into the field of data privacy um, today, what would you what would you advise people? I get this question um, a lot, and I know my path and your path, but um, it might be different today. So, do you have any any thoughts on on that? Yeah, I also have a lot of conversations um, along these lines. I speak at colleges and. Um, and other, you know, other uh, places um, of, uh, ed, you know, educational institutions. Um, privacy is becoming technical and it is getting operationalized in companies. 
So if I were talking to someone in high school or in college and they were to say, ask me, what should I major in? I really want to go into privacy. What I would say is some combination of law, um, you know, sort of the regulatory world and engineering. Because privacy is no longer going to just be an issue of what I'll call governance. That often is a discussion that privacy professionals like lawyers and, and, and um, folks with MBAs and whatnot will, will organize, but it is going to become technical and built into products and built into services that are digital. So um, I think an engineering background or, or deep comfort with engineering even if that's not the degree, um, will be incredibly useful to almost every organization in the either right now or in the very near future. Great, thank you for that. I'm sure uh, we have some in the audience taking notes either for themselves or for their, their um, children. So th thank you so much. Um, we are reaching the end of the hour. So uh, we now have the pleasure of turning to Ms. Aradna Kumar Kapoor, Director and General Counsel at MEGA for closing remarks. Aradna, thanks so much for being here today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tammy. And thank you, Julie and Denise. This was a very interesting conversation. And um, Julie's offered a number of lessons that we can take from her experience addressing the privacy issues in Microsoft and the guidance she's offered to not only to the World Bank, but other companies as well who are listening in to develop their privacy program. I was, of course, also pleased to know that uh, the World Bank Group, we are uh, on the right track and we're doing, uh, as, as Tammy says, we're reflective of uh, a lot of the action that you're taking, we're doing as well. But just to highlight a couple of the points, uh, Dini in his opening remarks talked about how, you know, we are now all working using technology more often as we work, socialize and entertain um, during these COVID times. And he talked about how the companies who are collecting data need to be collecting it responsibly and keeping it, respons keeping it um, in a responsible manner. And Julie and Tammy both highlighted that this is uh, the accountability of corporations is very uh, important during this build time. And Julie said that it is the number one job at Microsoft to build trust with the consumers. And that's a very important part for all of us and even at the World Bank for us to know that when we collect data, we should know why we're collecting it, use it appropriately, and of course, store it and keep it appropriately. And only as we talked about, collecting data only when it's really necessary and when it's needed. Uh, we talked about the fact that data goes beyond just what we were talking about contract tracing and uh, we can tr it, it really helps in unlocking so many other aspects of economic recovery and climate change and so many other ways that we can actually use data. So it's really important for us to do that. And building on that, we talked about the principles that are embodied in the GDPR, which involve actually where the World Bank Group policy also embodies the same principles and the principles that Microsoft has, the seven principles that you put in place. And Tammy has, as a World Bank um, DPO, Data Privacy Officer has also put in place and embodied into our principles. So it's good to know that we understand that these are, this is an ongoing conversation. We must continue to talk about data privacy. We must own data privacy, as Julia said, we should it should become privacy by default. We should think about it, but always remember the principles of transparency, consumer empowerment, corporate responsibility, and, um, and, and strong em enforcement, which then takes us to the fact that from the World Bank perspective, we're also trying to make sure that we are build the trust of our clients. And as Tammy said, since we're not subject to any national laws, build our own um, mechanisms in place where we can show that we are being held accountable. And we should be held accountable because as a public uh, multilateral development organization, we need to be, we're not only held accountable by our board of directors and our member countries, but we should be sure that all clients and our private sector clients are aware of that. 
So that's a very important task that we're going to be taking, looking into. Of course, as we go into this, it was interesting to know about uh, the fact that Microsoft is also has mandatory trainings for people as we do, and we are building on that as well. And raising awareness, which becomes challenging in these organizations like yours and ours, where we are spread across a hundred and something countries and making sure that the level of knowledge and information that everybody has is equal and that they have access to the latest um, training sessions and the awareness that you want to build in every, every staff member. So really, I, I feel that as we come away, these lessons are particularly per pertinent for organizations such as Mika, as well as IFC, where we work very mostly with private sector clients and uh, to support investments into developing countries. Our clients are subject to data privacy regulations across multiple jurisdictions in many cases. And therefore, it's very important for us, for our continued engagement with them, that we must continue to demonstrate our commitment to maintaining and building that trust and to also really show them that we manage their data and well, as well as our own data very responsibly. The work of the World Bank Group Institutions has always been and will continue to be data intensive. The information we collect is critical to us completing our mission and being able to serve our clients and that is and our host countries. At the same time, we have to continue to find ways to do more and to, to do more projects and to do more by the development outcome and to consider how we can fulfill this mission while collecting less personal data. As the World Bank Group policy, privacy policy takes effect on February 1st, our efforts will be focused both on maintaining and building the trust of our clients, while at the same time, continuing to reinforce with our staff the importance of maintaining data responsibly. As we have seen, data privacy is a living concept and evolving all the time. This will require us and our clients to stay current with new developments and refine our approach to privacy. I'd really like to thank Julie and Tammy for a very interesting conversation. I think we learned a lot and we took away a lot. So thank you so much. Over to you, Tammy. Thank you, Aradna. Greatly appreciate your comments um, and, and wrap up thoughts. Um, Julie, it's been a pleasure. I know that uh, we've all learned much from you and really appreciate your time being here. Um, Denis, Aradna, thank you very much for your support. Thanks to all the team's supports um, because a lot goes into um, an event like this. Um, so we have more to come today. Um, up next is a panel of leading global experts. So I would encourage you to uh, join that if you can. And uh, we have a CIO panel after that. And then we have a wonderful spoken word performance um, and a discussion on the link between racism and data privacy. So please join us. Um, and thank you very, very much again, Julie. It's been a privilege. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.